10 minutes now. We will resume with um, more on this matter of the <clears throat> canon of the New Testament, looking at section four. We've completed the uh, very quick overview of the historical survey of the evidence. And now we go to section four, the final stage of the process, which was the church councils. So by the end of the fourth century, the individual books had been brought together into a 27 piece collection. It was the church's councils of the fourth century that closed the canon of the New Testament. The statements made by the councils did not cause the books to have authority. The decisions made at the councils instead recognized that the books uh, already had achieved authoritative status in the churches. So they, they were recognizing, not granting authority. That's another way of putting it. Consequently, the canonization process was a long process. And that process began at the grassroots level in their composition by authoritative authors and in their reception and use in the local churches. It ended at the councils where the canon was closed. The councils recognized the New Testament books as canon. They did not establish them as such. And see Carson and Moo on this very point. So it's really important for us as evangelicals that hold a high view of the scripture to recognize that these documents were inspired and authoritative from the beginning. That's why the churches used them. That's why the churches transmitted them. The churches copied them and preserved them and continued to use them. It's not like because of the Council of Carthage in the late uh, fourth century did these books become known and um, that these books were then at that time disseminated or distributed through the churches. All of that had been done prior to it. And it's just the leaders of that church council said, this is the reality. It's these 27 books that have this status um, and therefore they are recognized as the canon. Now, this becomes important not only as we face off in debate with Roman Catholics, who would argue that the leaders, the human leaders of the churches possessed an antecedent authority, but it also helps us in dealing with things such as um, the Da Vinci Code that came up oh, about 15 years ago. Uh, around the world where you've got somebody who's basically making up a fictional story, uh, but he makes a claim at the beginning of the book that what he's saying is based upon real historical evidence. <clears throat> and he claims that there were leaders of the church that came, became very powerful. And it was because of their decisions and their biases that we have the form of Christianity that actually exists. And they would say that there were other alternatives, there were other documents, there were other important influences in the early church, but those were suppressed by the powerful leaders of the church because they didn't like those, those other people and other ideas. And because of their own power, the actual books that are in the New Testament became canonized. And so that, that's a really a perversion of this idea that human beings granted authority and canonical status is worse than what we deal with in the Roman Catholic tradition. But you can see how Dan Brown made use of that very idea that it's the humans that really established and wielded the authority to make these books canonical books. That's just not what happened. They were authoritative, they were inspired, uh, they were used by the churches for hundreds of years prior to that. Okay, any questions about that, uh, that basic point that we've got there in, in section 4.1? Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Uh, I was yeah. just curious, no? Uh, I have not read any, baga, ah, <clears throat> I've not read any church history books or, or so, but or just I was just curious where the, the canonized uh, Catholic Bible came. Is it the same council? And then there was just something added later on, or is it a, a, a separate council? Yeah. The Catholic uh, Bible. Yeah. So basically, what you've got is, from what I can remember, is that these these decisions were recognized by the Eastern Church, which we would think of as the Orthodox Church, and it was recognized by the Western Church, which would be the Roman Church. Mm -hmm. And so these decisions were were wide ranging across the, let's call them the denominations that existed in the first century. And when you think about the New Testament, the Roman Catholic Church's list of books are the same 27 books that we have. Mm -hmm. that, that's not the issue. The issue is, uh, can their church leaders today tell us that one particular interpretation of the scriptures must be binding as opposed to uh, what the New Testament would say on its own, interpreted by people following exegesis in the Protestant tradition? Those are very different approaches to theological authority. So, in the Catholic tradition, it's the leaders of the church who determine the canon, which implies they have an antecedent or previous authority, which is higher than the actual documents. And when they mm -hmm. use that, for instance, to say uh, that even though the New Testament doesn't really teach the perpetual virginity of Jesus, we as leaders of the church, we teach that. And our our knowledge, our opinion, our teaching um, supersedes what the New Testament says. So it's it's that kind of thing where the where the Roman Catholic canon differs from our canon has to do with the apocryphal books or what they call the deuterocanonical books that are in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and that's really not our subject here, but you can read about that um, in, in the literature that I mentioned earlier, how the New Testament Protestant Bible differs from the Catholic Old Testament. It doesn't really pertain so much to the New Testament, but um, that's a good question, uh, Pastor Fidel. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So with the New Testament, we really don't have a dispute with them about what the books are in the New Testament canon. Our dispute is how do you go about imply, applying them or interpreting them? That's where we would differ, because we see the authority in the text. They see the authority in the human beings that establish the text. Yeah. OK, um, so with regard to this, uh, the last section here, 4.2, the product of this ancient process binds us today. The New Testament canon has come to refer to the closed collection of documents that constitute authoritative scripture, quoting Carson and Moo. And I say a hearty amen to that. Uh, it binds us today. We don't have additional books like the Mormons have. Um, the what is it, the Pearl of Great Price and the Book of Mormon. We don't publish additional books and make them equally authoritative to the New Testament. We don't claim that church tradition is of equal authority to the New Testament documents. We don't say that human beings, um, like the leader of or president of a denomination, has higher authority than the New Testament. The, the New Testament documents combined with the Old Testament, making a 66 book Bible, that is the authority. It's not in humans, it's not in traditions, it's not in innovations. 
And so we are tied as a modern church to a document that's 2000 years old, which binds us. It has authority over us and that should not change and it cannot change. That's why we as evangelical Protestants determine the rightness or wrongness of some matter by how it stands up to the teaching of scripture. And so it continues to bind us today. <clears throat> so, um, and you as pastors or teachers in Christian schools or denominational leaders or missionaries, you've lived this uh, in, in many ways. The, the thing that we always have to watch is any of us can get into a situation where we don't like what the Bible says, and therefore we try to escape what the Bible says in some way. That's not what any of us really uh, want to do, but we may find ourselves falling into that just because we're biased. Yeah. So preach the Bible, teach the Bible, and when you're doing it, use exegesis so as to establish what the text originally meant so that it provides a control over what it means today. That's the basic hermeneutical approach once you've accepted the idea of the 27 book New Testament. Okay, uh, section five on the handout actually addresses various specific questions uh, about <clears throat> the canon as it might be experienced by those of us uh, involved in interpreting the New Testament in, a, in an overall Roman Catholic context. And so I'm not going to go through those now. I will let you read through them at your own uh, pace in your own time. But it's really just applying what we've talked about to specific issues that arise in our Roman Catholic ministry context. Um, any other comments or questions or matters for discussion with regard to New Testament canon? that we've gone through in sections one through five. <clears throat> well, hopefully this very quick, this short summary of the matter of New Testament canon will give you the basis to answer uh, uh, the kind of question that you will likely be asked. And if it doesn't, it will give you the basis to proceed to further study in order to obtain other answers that might be needed for questions that you're uh, going to be asked in the future. So um, at this point, unless there is further discussion about the matter of canon, what I want to do is proceed to the matter of uh, New Testament theology. And that will require you to have before you the <clears throat> other handout that was posted in Google Classroom. And the title of that is A Brief Introduction to New Testament Theology. So, we have gone through this year, beginning with New Testament 1 back in August and ending with the book of Revelation just last week, we have covered every New Testament book this year. We've dealt with questions of introduction. We've dealt with basic theology. We have dealt with hermeneutical matters, uh, which we call exegesis. And at this point, late in the second semester, we're dealing with issues that are more what we would call synthesis issues. That is working from the individual books of the New Testament to what we call canon. That is the putting together of something that was not put together in this manner originally. Canon is a synthesis. It's a man-made uh, product of sorts. We now move on to another type of synthesis, another type of man-made product, and that is theology. Now, it is true that we get our theology 
from the authoritative books of the Bible. But when we deal with theology, what we're doing is we're taking the raw materials found in the biblical books, and we're extracting those materials out from their context in the biblical book, and we're using these words or terms or ideas in a new context, and that is what we call theology. And we, as human beings, are the writers of this theology. And it's like we're the assembly men or the assembly women of this new thing that we're putting together. We're getting our pieces from the Bible, but those pieces end up being part of a new product, a new shape, a new assembly that is not equal to the Bible itself. So that is what we call a synthesis. Synthesis means man-made. Theology is a man-made product. The only way you can not be involved in synthesis is simply to read the Bible, okay? Just read the Bible in the order in which it presents itself. And best, of course, would be to read it in Hebrew, the original, and read it in Greek, the original. When we deal with the Bible in translation, as all of us do all the time, out of necessity, we are reading the results of a human process called translation or interpretation. And so we're already dealing with a synthesis of sorts. And that is the Bible in a language that is not original. When we do theology, we take it another step away from the original compositions of scripture because we extract bits and pieces from various parts of the Bible and we manufacture, using them in a manufacturing process to come up with a new product. We do that as human theologians. So theology is synthesis. And in order to do that, we need to have some ground rules in place so that it's done properly. And this brief introduction to New Testament theology begins with a term and that term is prolegomena, prolegomena. That's a Greek term, and it basically is used to mean the things that you say before you start, the values that you hold before you start in the process of creating theology. <clears throat> so what are our starting points? What are our initial values? What are our assumptions about the process called theology? Well, we can quickly run through some of them. First of all, theology about New Testament books <clears throat> uh, is a preface to New Testament theology. So what, I'm, what I mean here is, what does the Bible say about the Bible theologically that should inform our use of the Bible. So what's the theology about the New Testament books? We use that as a, an assumption, as a given when we begin the process of creating theology. Well, what is it that the Bible says about itself? We're going to look at some texts that help remind us of our doctrine of the Bible. That's one of the issues or starting points that's part of the prolegomena of our theological uh, endeavor. In addition, there are two other bits of prolegomena. One is what we call exegesis, that when you do New Testament theology, you practice exegesis in the understanding of the text that you use. A third bit of prolegomena is theology is a matter of synthesis, and that is putting together insights taken from various places in the scripture to create a synthetic or man-made theological statement that's different from 
the precise context and statements that you use from the Bible. So these are the three things, the theology about the Bible, exegesis as a method, and synthesis as a method. All of those are kind of starting points that we recognize when we begin to do theology in any sort using the Bible. So we begin with the first bit of prolegomena, and that is the apostolic or first century Christian writings are scripture. So what is it that the New Testament says about itself that should ground our approach to producing theology? Well, we're reminded in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, of two very important ideas. First of all, scripture is holy or sacred. The Greek term is hiera. Holy or sacred is the way that's translated. This means that scripture is set apart from other literature by its quality. Okay? It's set apart from other literature in its quality. So you've all heard about the, the books, The Lord of the Rings or the Chronicles of Narnia, classic English literature. Um, then the writings of um, J.K. Rowling, what is it, the Harry Potter series. These are all books that have been made into movies in recent decades. Um, those are bits of classic English literature. And the Bible, is superior in quality to those bits or examples of English literature. It's not that those are bad writings in English. They're actually very well written in the English language, but the Bible is superior to them because it is holy or sacred. It's superior to other literature because of this. That's what this passage tells us. A second thing this passage tells us is that scripture is God-breathed words, God-breathed, telling us that the ultimate source of the Bible, the ultimate source of sacred writings is God himself. And this too is a reason for its superiority. All of the writings that we call Harry Potter books, they came from one particular woman by the name of J.K. Rowling. She doesn't claim that they came from God, but the scriptures, they indicate that the ultimate source is not a human being like Peter or James or Paul or Matthew, that because they are God-breathed words, they source is ultimately God. That's a very important starting point that we're reminded of when we do our theology. We're dealing with sacred literature that's God-breathed in terms of its wording, okay? So these are basic ideas of the theology about the New Testament books that we get from the New Testament itself. Another important scripture is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. These verses speak about scripture. They call it prophecy of scripture. So it seems like when we have the term prophecy of scripture, maybe it's not talking about law of scripture, or it's not talking about psalms of scripture, or gospels of scripture, or letters of scripture, but only prophecy. But we have to keep in mind that even if it's specifically talking about one genre of the biblical corpus, that genre being prophecy, it's not speaking exclusively that this only applies to prophecy. No, it would apply to prophecy specifically, but because there are other genres that appear in Scripture, and they, too, participate in the same characteristics or qualities as the specific qualities described here 
as applying to prophecy. So we can think of these as applying also to Hebrew poetry and poetic books of the Old Testament or historical books of the Old Testament or books of law of the Old Testament or letters or gospels of the New Testament. It's not so much just a characteristic of prophecy. What Peter is talking about here is a characteristic of scripture. So what does he say? Well, first of all, he says the prophecy of scripture is from God. So this idea is repeated here that the ultimate source of scripture is God. And we have that via the work of the Holy Spirit. But also it says that men spoke. Okay, the prophecy of scripture is from God, but men spoke. This reminds us that the immediate source of scripture is a human being. Therefore, we have human authorship. And if we have God as an author, and we have a human being as an author, then we have what is sometimes called dual authorship of the, the Bible books that we're, we're dealing with here. <clears throat> I just realized that I didn't take time to actually read these passages. I'm just making comments on them. So I'm going to open my NIV Bible and turn to 2 Peter and chapter 1 and read these verses. <clears throat> he says <clears throat> in verse 20, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so these uh, phrases that I put on the handout obviously come from this uh, or these verses, specifically verse 21. So they spoke from God, indicating ultimate source, but it is also men spoke. They are the immediate source of the scripture. And it goes on to modify and add to the circumstance or the conditions by which these men spoke from God. They did this as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so this, this comparative phrase, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, performs a modification of the main verb, men spoke. This is how they were able to do this. They were enabled by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes this is translated as superintended, as they were superintended and moved by the Holy Spirit, they were able to speak from God. And so here we're reminded again, like we were in, in uh, first, P, uh, first Timothy, that these authors are inspired and they were able to give us God-breathed words. So it's not just Second Timothy chapter 3. It's 2 Timothy chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1 that reminds us of the quality or the nature of what we are interpreting. It's sacred scripture. It's God-breathed. Human beings spoke, but they spoke from God as they were enabled by the Holy Spirit. So these comments, of course, were made at a time in which the scripture that existed in the time of Paul and Peter was the Old Testament. There was no canon of the New Testament. So these are basically statements about Old Testament scripture. But what we can see is that they cannot be limited in a literalistic or legalistic way so as to say that they don't help us to explain at all the New Testament idea of inspiration and canon. Uh, there's more that we can draw upon that helps us in order to see that this idea of canonical sacred scripture, yes, it's the Old Testament, 
but it moves on beyond just the New Testament to apply to the New Testament as well. In Acts chapter 1, verse 25, we read that Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David. So here the New Testament looks back at Psalm 69, uh, verse 25, and talks about how the Holy Spirit spoke. That sounds a lot like what Peter said in the passage we just read. Furthermore, in Acts chapter 4, verse 25, we read, You, referring to the Lord, spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations raise and the people plot in vain? So here we've got the New Testament pointing back to Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, and saying that the Holy Spirit spoke through David. And so in two New Testament passages, we have this idea that God speaks through a human being, David, but God speaks by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit so as to allow the human being to give us the words of God. Now, those two verses in Acts basically illustrate what we learn from 2 Timothy and 2 Peter. But what about this idea of the New Testament documents? Well, we have two other or additional passages in the New Testament that help us to see that this idea of inspiration and authority would apply to the writings of the New Testament apostles as well. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, we find Peter making comments about the writings of the Apostle Paul. And let me read these for you. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking of them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. So what we see here is that one apostle, Peter, is looking on and at the work of another apostle, Paul. He calls Paul's letters scripture, and he says he writes these things in his letters by the wisdom that God gave him. And so it appears that Peter is recognizing that God is speaking through Paul, and the result of it is scripture, like what Peter saw in the Old Testament prophetical books and in other scripture as well. So it appears that Peter is extending to Paul the prerogative of composing holy writ, composing God's word, according to this passage. Now, Paul seems to think that God's doing the same kind of thing. And we see that from something that Paul says about himself and the things he himself uh, had been saying in the ministry to the Thessalonian church. So if you want to look at this, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Again from the NIV, I'm reading. Paul writes, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God. So here you see some pretty important concepts or terms. What did they hear? What did they receive? They received the word of God. But how did they receive it? Through what means? He says, you heard it from us. And when you heard it, you did not limit it and say that this is only the word of men. When they received it, 
they received it as the word of God. So with what Paul says is the word of God, then we have, again, a high assessment of what Paul is saying. So uh, the Apostle Paul appears to think that he himself had spoke for God in a manner that is very similar to or even equal to the way he looked at Old Testament scripture. And so on the basis of these two New Testament passages, we can apply or extend the same principles of inspiration and authority to the New Testament documents, the 27 that we've just talked about is canon. So <clears throat> apostolic Christian writings are scripture according to this brief uh, assessment. We move on to the next and related topic is that scripture is authoritative. Scripture is authoritative. It is given that God's words are authoritative by their nature. So if God is omniscient, if God is truthful, then whatever he says is by nature inherently authoritative. We would be fools to disregard what God tells us if God knows everything and he always speaks truthfully about this. And so this matter of authority, again, can be summed up from observation of a few passages. Like we said earlier, Jesus claimed that all authority had been given to him, and he uses it to command the disciples to teach and make disciples. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, when Paul's talking about the hierogramata, the sacred scripture that is God-breathed, he says the practical value of this is that it's, <clears throat> excuse me, my, my phone just gave me a message about the battery. Paul says that the scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. Now that is a practical value of the inspired and authoritative text. It's able to make you wise. It's authoritative to tell you this is the way to salvation, and you will not find salvation in other ways. <clears throat> so that is a practical or demonstrated authority. It's able to make you wise. It's able to get you saved. Or God will use it in the process of getting you saved. It's what Jesus did, which actually saves you, but it's the New Testament that tells you about that. Uh, similarly, chapter 2 uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 says that the inspired text is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And specifically here, when we're thinking about its usefulness for theology, we zero in on this. It's useful for teaching, for teaching. What is theology? Well, it's statements about the Bible and God and salvation that we teach to other people as God's truth. The Greek word for teaching is the word didaskalion, which literally means teaching, but in the King James Bible, even in the New King James Bible, the translation for this is doctrine. And of course, doctrine and theology are closely related. It just illustrates the chapter three, verse 16, when it says that the Bible is useful te for teaching, it means it's useful for theology and for theologizing. So it's authoritative. <clears throat> a third observation is that scripture is practical. In other words, it guides believers in daily life to be faithful and righteous. And we have to keep this in mind as a priority. It's not just to fill our heads with good thinking or with philosophy or theology. The purpose of scripture is to change our lives and our behaviors so that we're disciples of Jesus and not sinners. And so what are these practical values? Well, again, we turn to this very, very important and essential text, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We learned that the scripture is useful for training, for training. The Greek term is paideon, paideon, 
And that's the kind of term that you, you would use in this first century to describe uh, what you teach to a child that's necessary for growing up, for training. And so it's practical. You want a child to do things that are helpful. You want the child to learn skills that are useful or necessary to succeed in life. That's what it means to be practical. Furthermore, chapter 3, verse 16 says that the scriptures are useful to equip people for every good work. Again, this is practical. It helps us in daily life. It guides the members of the church to be able to accomplish work, which we call ministry. And so all of these are kind of assumptions or presuppositions that we make as we approach the New Testament in order to begin with what we call New Testament theology. Uh, any questions about these basic uh, principles of prolegomena, what the Bible says about itself, exegesis and synthesis as methodologies? Well, we know in our world today that not everybody agrees with these principles that we've just summarized. There are objections to this that are made by skeptics or critics. Not everybody will say that the Bible is an inspired book. Not everybody will say that the Bible is the word of God. Critics, skeptics will say, this is just another book like any other book. The only thing that makes it different is that these authors of the Bible were just kind of liars because they claimed to be writing for God when in reality they were not. They were just writing like any other human writer. These kinds of skeptics or critics empty the Bible of its divine source. They empty it of inspiration. And of course, once you do that, you empty the Bible of authority. So what do we do in light of that kind of, of criticism or hostility toward the Bible? Um, these critics would say things like, the scripture, you say that the scripture is inspired because uh, the scripture says it is. And they would say, well, that's a circular argument. And it is filled with subjectivity, which makes it uh, an illegitimate or at least a weak argument. That's what uh, critics can say when we approach the Bible in this manner. But are they right? Is that all that can be said? Is, is Christian theology caught up in a circular argument when we say the Bible teaches that the Bible is inspired, the word of God, authoritative, infallible, or even inerrant. Isn't that just a circular argument that goes nowhere? Well, we would respond, at least I would respond this way. That's not all that we would say. There's also the attestation provided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit confirms the inspiration of the Bible to believers in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. So if you have the Holy Spirit, if I have the Holy Spirit, it's the same Holy Spirit who inspired the human authors to write these biblical books. The Holy Spirit will tell us in the, our inner person that the words of the Bible are indeed God's words. They are indeed inspired words. They are indeed authoritative words. But if you don't have the Holy Spirit giving you that objective witness from another party, then you're left to evaluate the Bible as one book among the millions of books that have existed in human history. The Bible is no better, no worse than any of the other books that human beings have produced. That is, if the Holy Spirit is not inside you telling you that things are different for the Bible. So inspiration of scripture is objective. In other words, it can be confirmed from outside of ourselves. 
and outside of the of the Bible itself, but it's objective for those who possess the Holy Spirit. And so don't expect somebody who's an atheist or an agnostic, someone who's a critic or a skeptic of the Bible to accept this as well, because they dismiss it all. They dismiss God, therefore they dismiss the Holy Spirit, therefore they dismiss the Bible. So those kinds of people, you'll probably not be able to argue themselves into a you won't be able to argue them into agreeing with you. The reason I touch upon this is to reassure us as members of the church that their accusation against the Bible is not actually true and conclusive. We take it one step beyond because of the reality of the Holy Spirit who speaks to us as a third party that says to Steve that the Bible is indeed the word of God. So we have the Bible, we have Steve, and we have the Holy Spirit. It's not just the Bible saying things about itself. It's not just me accepting that. It's the Holy Spirit, the third party. That makes it objective um, for the Christian. It would not necessarily be so for the skeptic or the critic. So um, on that basis, I am comfortable, and I assume that you are comfortable with the soundness of looking at the Bible as an inspired, authoritative source for Christian theology. The church has been okay with that for about 2,000 years, and so we stand in that strong and long tradition as well. Any questions about or comments about the uh, the prolegomena matter for for Christian theology. Maybe there's some other verses that you would think of that are just as helpful or more helpful in establishing these kinds of things that we're talking about. If so, uh, tell us what those are. Of course, you know that, <clears throat> that theology can draw upon other sources than the Bible. Theology can draw upon history. Theology can draw upon philosophy. Uh, theology can draw upon human desire. That doesn't mean that it's good theology, but theology can draw upon lots of other things. When we talk about New Testament theology, we're limiting other sources. We're saying that our source for this theology must come from the New Testament, not from philosophers or historians, <clears throat> not from economists or politicians. This theology has to come from the New Testament, but it has to be informed by exegesis when we put it together synthetically into a form that it did not have originally in the New Testament context in which we're given. Okay, page two, a little bit about New Testament theology. What are we talking about here? And for seminarians, this is a good thing for you to understand because there are different branches of theology that will be talked about in your seminary curriculum. Most of us are familiar with what's called systematic theology. Sometimes it's called Christian theology. Sometimes it's called dogmatics. All of those terms basically refer to the same reality. New Testament theology is a theology of a different kind. Uh, another even third kind of theology would be called practical theology. Practical theology would encompass preaching the Bible, teaching the Bible, performing pastoral functions like baptisms and communion, uh, educational functions such as Sunday school and small group Bible studies. All of those things fall under the general category of practical theology. <clears throat> so that one is pretty easy to see how it stands separate. The problem comes for us to be able to understand the difference in our head between New Testament theology and systematic theology. 
So what I'm going to do now is to, to try to help you to understand this difference. So we're looking at page two, section Roman number, Roman numeral number two, New Testament theology. NTT is the abbreviation I use regularly. This can also be discussed in a different way under the heading of theology of the New Testament. They're not different things. They're just two different ways of referring to this. So I will use the former. And here's the first statement about this. New Testament theology deals with the actual theological content of the New Testament as it was expressed in the first century. Okay, so what you'll see here is that it's historical. We're talking about theological matters as they existed in the first century as expressed in these first century documents. Secondly, New Testament theology does not normally depend upon or use the classical topics of systematic theology. What are those classical topics of systematic theology? Some of you have probably taken classes at CGST in systematic or Christian theology. What are those courses entitled? Any of you have taken those? You can remember what the titles of those classes are because the, the titles of the classes are the topics of systematic theology. Share with us if you can remember. What's a topic of systematic theology? Nobody's taken systematic theology? <clears throat> Hi, sir. Uh, I took up uh, a uh, course last year. It was called Christology and Soteriology. Yes, very good. So there you have two of the classic topics of systematic theology. Soteriology is one of them, and Christology is another one of them. Okay, good. What are some of the others? maybe that you've taken class in. We actually have three systematic theology classes in our curriculum. What's one of the other ones? I think the other ones are theology and bibliology. Okay, theology proper would be Change what we believe about God. Uh, bibliology would be the kinds of things we just talked about on page one. That's our doctrine of the Bible. Good. Okay. Now, when it comes to the theology of God, in our curriculum, we have a class that has partly God as a focus or a topic, but it's combined with the doctrine of man. So we call it God and man. So one of our theology subjects is God and man. So those are two more of the classic topics of systematic theology. There's one other class. So we've got God and man, Christ and salvation. And then what's the last one? Anybody know? Eschatology, sir. Yes. Eschatology is another topic, but it's combined in our curriculum with <clears throat> the last topic that we need to be reminded of. What's eschatology taught alongside of? Church and last things. Church and last things. There you go. Very good. I knew that, <clears throat> that you guys would come up with them. So the third systematic theology class that we offer is church and last things. So church is a topic of systematic theology, the doctrine of the church, otherwise called ecclesiology. And then you have the doctrine of last things, otherwise called eschatology. So that in our curriculum of CGST covers six of the major topics of systematic theology. But New Testament theology generally doesn't use those topics because those topics have been developed over centuries of 
church doing theology, and they're very much related to concepts of philosophy. When it comes to New Testament theology, we're not going to be drawing from secular philosophy as a guide for the issues or topics or matters of New Testament theology. Where we turn to to find our talking points would be the biblical texts themselves, okay? And it may be that a biblical text talks about God, it talks about man, it talks about Christ, it talks about soteria, it talks about salvation, it talks about church, and it talks about eschatology in different places in the same document. That may be true, but it may also talk about something that doesn't fit into any of those categories as we typically find them discussed. <clears throat> Does a typical systematic theology book today talk about, let's say, um, gay marriage specifically? Well, I'm sure that as this it becomes a bigger and bigger issue in the world, that more theology is going to be written about it. But the classic systematic theology books that I'm familiar with, they don't have a section on gay marriage generally. There may be, excuse me, I've got to plug in my phone so that the battery does not expire before we're finished here. <clears throat> Just a minute. Okay. It's plugged in now. So we won't run out of battery. There are issues in our time and in our place that the Bible doesn't necessarily speak to. What about pollution of, of the uh, natural environment? Does the Bible say anything about that? Well, yes and no. It talks about the creation, that we're to be good stewards of it, but does it talk about specifically whether we should use electric vehicles or gasoline power vehicles or diesel power vehicles? Now, those are some of the issues that are being uh, discussed and, and argued back and forth in our world that it might be helpful for theology to say something about, but yet the Bible doesn't say anything about that. Um, what does it say about smoking marijuana or smoking tobacco cigarettes? Uh, it, they're just things that we face in our world that the Bible doesn't deal with. And so uh, our systematic theology books might want to make theological statements about that, but the Bible itself doesn't give us any raw material for it. And so when we're dealing with New Testament theology, we're dealing with the topics or issues, concerns, or motifs, principles that the biblical texts deal with. We're not dealing with those things as determined in our present or current life in the world today. Okay, <clears throat> any question about that? The difference between systematic topics and how we go about doing New Testament theology from what I've said so far. Okay, well, New Testament theology can be divided into subgroups. You can do New Testament uh, theology for all 27 books at one time, or you could break it down into parts of the New Testament. You could do the theology of the Synoptic Gospels. You could do the theology of Paul, the theology of John, or the theology of Luke, if that seemed to be helpful in some way. So you can use subgroups, which would be a division of New Testament theology. New Testament theology can uh, takes up the task of demonstrating unity and diversity of thought between the parts of the New Testament. For instance, comparing Paul and James and their doctrine of righteousness or justification. How are they saying things that are different or how are they saying things that are the same? So you demonstrate the unity and diversity of the parts of the New Testament and you go along further to demonstrate continuity and discontinuity with the Old Testament. So, for instance, how do we get along with um, 
in the Old Testament, the God's people are forbidden to eat pork. But yet in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Mark, we have Jesus declaring all foods clean. How do we put these things together? How do these two different, apparently different statements, how can we reconcile them and see them as both being true? Well, New Testament theology or biblical theology would deal with that in some way. <clears throat> Next, New Testament theology is historical and descriptive, whereas systematic theology is contemporary and normative. Now, we need to pause here to unpack this to help uh, y'all to understand what we're really talking about here. And this is a key to understanding the difference between New Testament theology and systematic. So first of all, New Testament theology is historical. That means that the theology that we're uncovering, the theology we're stating, is theology that belonged in the first century. The biblical books of the New Testament deal with theology needs of the first century. It's not dealing with the theology of the 12th century. It's not dealing with the theology of the 21st century. It's dealing with the theology of the first century. Therefore, it's a historical endeavor. Secondly, New Testament theology is descriptive. In other words, we, we simply state or describe what that theology is all about. There's no implication that that theology from the first century is really still applicable and binding on a person today living in Cebu City. Now, it might be that it's still applicable. It's probable that it's still applicable, but you don't, you'd have to prove it or demonstrate that it's applicable. You don't assume that it was. So New Testament theology is an endeavor or an enterprise that seeks to make a statement about the theology of the New Testament that's historical, i.e. <clears throat> rooted in the realities of the first century, and it describes it. It doesn't necessarily suggest or argue that it still applies to today. On the other hand, when you're dealing with systematic theology, the kind of thing we learn in those three classes that CGST offers, the kind of material you learn when you read Millard Erickson's book, Christian Theology, or when you read Wayne Grudem's book, Systematic Theology, what you find there is a, is a contemporary statement of theology. In other words, it's theology as we believe it and as we teach it today. It's applicable today. It's contemporary. That's in contrast with New Testament theology, which was historical. It was relevant and applicable in the first century. So that is a, a very clear contrast between the two kinds of theology. In what time frame do they apply? That's a big difference. Systematic theology applies now in the contemporary. Furthermore, a difference between the two is that systematic theology sets norms. It attempts to say what the church must believe today, what the church must do today. When you say must, you're talking about things that are norms. They are obligations, they're requirements that apply to the believer today. And so systematic theology is intended to set forth theological and behavioral norms. By contrast, the New Testament theology, it doesn't do that. It simply describes what people in the first century might have thought of as normative, but there's no necessarily necessary correlation that what was binding and normative in the first century is still binding and normative in the 21st century. So that's a second difference between the two kinds of theology. Now, let me pause here to ask, 
do you want to have any questions about this contrast between the two types of theology? Any need for clarification? Follow-up question. So that must be clear as mud, or clear enough, I should say. We move on then. While the New Testament looks at the Old Testament as inspired and authoritative, we cannot obtain genuine Christian theology without using the New Testament, because the New Testament is the explicitly Christian revelation. Now, of course, we still look at the Old Testament as our canonical uh, source, but without the New Testament, we can't really arrive at Christian theology. We have to have the New Testament. <clears throat> Further matter of terminology, there is what we call Old Testament theology, OTT. And there is, as we've been talking about here, New Testament theology, and the two are not the same. When you write a book in which you deal with Old Testament theology plus New Testament theology, that kind of work is called biblical theology. Okay, so I'm just trying to lay out some terminology that applies when you're studying the New Testament and you're doing research and preparation for sermons and Bible studies. It will be helpful for you to know this kind of distinction in, um, in the theological endeavor. Any questions between any of these terms that I've set forth here for you? My master's degree thesis at Ashland Seminary back in 1986 was written in the area of biblical theology. I asked the question is, is covenant an adequate organizing principle for doing Old Testament and New Testament biblical theology? And if you're curious about that, you can look in the BTC library because there's a copy of my master's thesis there in the, um, in the bookshelves that have all the theses from our faculty members. So this is something that I'm pretty familiar with <clears throat> because my master's thesis was in the area of biblical theology. Furthermore, when I wrote my PhD dissertation at Fuller Seminary in 2001, it was finished, my dissertation was on a narrow part of New Testament theology, and that was on Paul's teaching and doctrine of revelatory experiences. And so if you want to uh, learn about what I did in that, you can read that also because it's in the BTC library. Again, in the section on dissertations and theses, you can find that. So <clears throat> uh, we have really good books in our library about New Testament theology. One of the most famous or classic books is a book entitled New Testament Theology by uh, George Eldon Ladd. Uh, another good one that we have is New Testament Theology by Leon Morris. Uh, I've used both of those books at various times in classes on New Testament theology. Uh, I can highly recommend them to you. Uh, if you want to read them. Another one is by Donald Guthrie, a uh, book on New Testament theology. Excellent resources that are available if you want to learn more about uh, New Testament theology. Uh, again, any questions or comments that, that you feel that you want to ask about this? So we're now talking about how we use New Testament documents to do theological synthesis. Thanks. 
I hope the squeaking of my chair is not irritating to you. I hope that it doesn't disturb those of you who are listening on the video recording, but there's really no way I can keep it from, from making those noises unless I sit absolutely stationary or still. And I can't do that for three hours. Any question about this introduction to New Testament theology? Next week, we will continue on. We really don't have time to get into the major theological themes, motifs, or loci for this. We will receive, uh, we will keep this in reserve for next week. And I'll try to do some things that help draw together uh, the, the big picture of the New Testament and specifically the big picture of its theology. And we'll start by observing some major theological themes this section next week. Any question? Any comment? <clears throat> and again, if during the week you think of something that you wish you would have thought of right now to ask, feel free to send it to me in some way, and I'll try my best to respond in a timely manner for you. Before we sign off here, let me just remind you that if there are assignments that you have not completed, use this next week to do them. Uh, there is no additional assignment for next week so that you have some extra time or free time to do some wrap up of the incomplete tasks that may still exist. Uh, there's no need at this point to start preparing for a final exam. Just let this week be occupied with doing other things. No questions, responses, comments. Thank you for doing the recording, Pastor Gabe. And I will bid You're you welcome. all farewell until next Thursday morning when we will meet for class number 17 for this semester. Until then, serve the Lord.